Hello and welcome to this week's lecture on comparative advantage. I'm Mike Wenz and I'll be guiding you through the slides today. One of the things that we realize early on in, in economics when we think about the value of markets is something called the gains from trade. And the gains from trade come about when we find opportunities to trade with other people in a way that makes us both better off. And one of the things that I think you'll find fairly quickly when you think about it is that whenever we exchange something uh, for something else, we, we both leave happier as long as this exchange is voluntary. Uh, I, I refer you to an article written some time ago by John Stossel, uh, who, where he talks about something called the double thank you moment. And, and in the article, he asks the question, how many times have you paid a dollar for a cup of coffee? Or two ninety five if you do it at Starbucks, uh, and after the clerk says thank you, and you respond thank you. There's a the, John Stossel says there's a wealth of economics wisdom in the weird double thank you moment. Why does it happen? Because you want the coffee more than the money, and the store wants the money more than the coffee. You both win. And when we think about it, most of our exchanges take advantage of this uh, of this phenomenon. The the key economic insight here is to note that voluntary exchange leaves both sides better off. Now, the, the opportunity for gains, for gains from trade comes from two different phenomena. The first is when we have differences in productive, uh, productive ability. If I'm faster at typing and you're faster at doing math, then I should type and you should do math in a relative sense. Uh, they also come about because we have differences in tastes. If I like different things than you have, uh, then, then we can trade away the things that, uh, the, the things that you prefer in exchange for the things that I prefer. Both of these things, the differences in productive ability and differences in personal tastes, give rise to the possibility for mutually agreeable and mutually advantageous exchange. Opportunity cost. We, we saw in, in, in earlier lectures that the cost of something is the value of the next best alternative given up. It's not the value of everything you give up, but just what you would have done instead. Now, we can think a little bit more seriously about opportunity cost and, and, and think about this notion of productivity uh, by, by considering a numerical example. Suppose that I can type 50 words per minute and I could solve 25 math problems per minute. Divide one by the other, you can see that each math problem costs me two words. All the time I spend doing, uh, doing math problems, uh, I, I, can do wor I can type words essentially twice as fast. And so each math problem costs me two words. Alternatively, we can look at it a different way, where each word costs me one half of a math problem. 25 math problems per minute divided by 50 words problem, word problems per minute means that, it means that we get one half math problem done for every word we type. This, this ratio, this fraction, is, is reflecting the cost of one activity in terms of the other activity. So we see that each math problem costs two words, or alternatively, each word that we type costs us one half of a math problem. Consider a person who, who can type 50 words per minute, or do 25 math problems per minute, or uh, alternate between those, those two things at this, this constant rate of typing and or uh, math speed. Now, this person has essentially their own production possibilities frontier. And what we've done is we've graphed this on this slide uh, with words on the, on the vertical axis and math problems on the horizontal axis. And what we see here is that, uh, is that by looking at this, this line connecting the two dots, we have this person's production possibilities frontier, this individual's production possibilities frontier. Now, the slope of this production possibilities frontier represents the trade-off of, uh, of problems versus words. How many problems can they exchange for, for one word? If they, switch from, uh, if they switched away from doing a math problem, they could type an extra two words. The slope, then, of this line is minus two, and the slope we see represents the opportunity cost of solving a math problem. So if this person spends half their time at each task, you can see there would be at the middle of this line. They could do 12 and a half problems in a minute and 25 words in a minute. And everywhere along this line, everywhere along this production possibilities frontier, uh, represents the trade-off between words and math problems, represents the opportunity cost of, of math problems in terms of words. 
Now, the, the production possibilities frontier for a society is probably not a straight line. It probably has this bowed outward shape. Uh, and what this says is that the opportunity cost of, of, of producing something is not uh, it is not likely to be constant. In, in our simple example of math and typing, it's probably pretty close. But at an economy-wide level, uh, and even if you think about an individual, when you allow them more than a minute to allocate between tasks, uh, it, it's likely not going to have that, that, that straight line shape. It's likely con going to be bowed. The bowed shape indicates what we call increasing relative opportunity costs. What that means is that the more resources we devote to producing one good, the larger the opportunity cost is. A, a simple example perhaps would help. Uh, in the United States, we grow oranges and we grow corn, but we grow them in very different places. Suppose that we grew, suppose that we decided to only grow corn in the United States. That means we would, we would have to tear up all the orange groves in Florida and replace them with, with, with corn fields. Now, if we were going to decide to move from producing all corn to producing some oranges, it makes only good sense to, to think that we would tear up the first, the, the, the best places to grow oranges in order to plant those orange groves. We would start by using the property in, in Florida to grow, to grow oranges, and the opportunity cost there would be relatively small. It, we wouldn't have to tear up much space to get a whole lot of extra orange crops. Um, the land there is particularly well suited for growing oranges. Conversely, if we think about a world where we grew all oranges, if we think about a world where we grew all oranges, and, and, and so that, the, uh, the, the, that the, the plains of Illinois were littered not with cornfields, but littered with orange groves, when we started to, to switch from growing all oranges to growing some corn, uh, the, the, the first place that we would give up, the, the first orange grove we would tear up, is likely going to be in, in Illinois, a place that's not particularly well suited to growing oranges. And so uh, we would tear up a, an orange grove that's not very productive, that, that grows few oranges, to replace it with some of the most fertile corn land in the United States. We would be able to get a, a very high corn yield for a place that doesn't grow much, uh, that, that doesn't cost us much in terms of oranges because it's not very well suited to, uh, to the production of oranges. What this says is that if we devote all of our resources to producing one thing, uh, the, the opportunity cost of producing that last, that, that last orange by trying to grow it in Illinois is very high. Uh, an orange grove in Illinois grows few oranges, but costs us lots of corn. Remember again what we learned on the previous slide, that the slope of the production possibilities frontier represents the opportunity cost of producing good one in terms of producing good two. And we see that this slope gets steeper. In other words, as we produce more and more of good one, the opportunity cost of producing good one is getting higher and higher and higher. This is what gives us the bowed shape of the production possibilities frontier.